Pearl Jam was without a doubt one of the biggest bands in the world by the time they released their second album, Versus, in 1993. The past two years had been a whirlwind for the group going from obscurity to superstars overnight. It was no secret that the band struggled to come to terms with their success and fame, and adding to that pressure was the media obsession with all things from Seattle in the early 90s. Guitarist Stone Gossard would remark to the LA Times, there's so much hype you could choke on it. I wish people would forget that we came from Seattle. It'd be nice if they thought we came from Cleveland or someplace like that, he'd remark. At one point, frontman Eddie Vedder contemplated leaving the group and becoming a solo artist and selling his music directly to fans from the luxury of his own home. It was those simple times during the early days of the band that Vedder was longing for. Recalling in the book Pearl Jam 20, on the first record we were living in a basement. I was pissing in Gatorade bottles and putting quarters in the parking meter so my truck wouldn't get tickets. On the second one, I felt too far away from the basement. Vetter would admit in the book Everybody Loves Our Town that Versus was his least favorite record to make. Vetter would tell the LA Times what he struggled with most, stating, People think you're this grand person with all their shit together because you're able to put your feelings into some songs. They write letters and come to the shows and even to the house, hoping we can fix everything for them, but we can't, because we don't have all our shit together either. What they don't understand is that you can't save somebody from drowning if you're treading water yourself, he would say. Vetter would be the only member of the band who didn't buy himself a new car. After the millions from 10 started pouring in, telling the LA Times, he still drove the same 1990 Toyota truck he had when he was working at a service station back in San Diego. While the initial rehearsals for Verses were done in Seattle, the band would relocate to just outside of San Francisco at a facility known as The Site. This studio offered peace and quiet and no distractions. The site had served other artists including Dolly Parton, Huey Lewis, as well as Linda Ronstadt. It was a far cry from their days in the basement as the studio featured a basketball court, a nearby golf course, a sauna, and even its own personal chef. Vetter would look back at the experience of writing the band's follow-up album at the site, recalling in Pearl Jam 20, It was a hard place for me at that point to write a record, especially with lyrics. I don't want to be writing about hillsides and trees among luxurious surroundings. I was more into people and society and chaos and confusion and answering the question, what are we all doing here? Those close to Vetter would echo similar sentiments with bassist Jeff and Met adding in the book Everybody Loves Our Town. Recording verses was a lot more pressure on Ed. I thought we were playing well as a band and that it would take care of itself. Toward the end, it got fairly intense. He was having a hard time finishing up songs, the pressure and not being comfortable in such a nice place. We tried to make it as uncomfortable as possible. He slept in a freaking sauna, he'd say. If you've read any of the interviews with band members around this time, then you'd know that drummer Dave Abrazis seemed like the black sheep or the odd man out. It was his first time recording with the band as Dave Cruzen had recorded their first record before leaving the band to deal with personal problems. Abrazis would refer to the recording studio of the site as an I quote paradise, telling Rolling Stone, to me when I was younger I heard about a band selling a million records, I thought the band would get together and jump up and down for at least a minute and just go wow I can't believe it, but it doesn't happen that way in this band. Me, I flip out, I jump up and down by myself, there's a lot of intensity over decisions and I think it's great, but every once in a while I wish everyone would just let it go, make a bad decision. Look at this place, it's paradise. In some respects, the members of Pearl Jam felt like they were revisiting their first album all over again, with a man telling Rolling Stone, it was a bit like we were making our first record all over again because it was with a different drummer and a new producer. And Dave had really different strengths as a drummer than Dave Cruzen. The groove shifted on the second record, he'd recall. It was Abruzis' enthusiasm for the lifestyle that also created tension within the band and eventually resulted in him being fired by the group a year later. I've done a whole video, the link is down below. The drummer would end up writing the guitar riff for the opening track, Go, that came from a campfire jam, and he also served as the inspiration for the lyrics for the song Glorified G. When he told Vetter one day he had purchased two guns, remarking they're glorified versions of a pellet gun. While the early days at the site appeared to go well with the band, recording Rats, Blood, Go, and Leash, then things would suddenly stop. Vetter was struggling with lyrical ideas. It would result in him leaving the studio for several days, driving into San Francisco, and sleeping in his truck. He would eventually return to the studio with a number of lyrical ideas. The band would enlist producer Brendan O'Brien, who was 32 at the time, after hearing his work on the Black Crow's debut record, Shake Your Money Maker. O'Brien would tell Rolling Stone, I think that my role at the time was really getting these guys in a room and getting them in a headspace to record and make records. In a lot of ways, it was a lot more difficult than it is now, just because they were trying to feel their way around it. The schedule for recording would be the same each morning. They would assemble in the studio kitchen at around 9.30 in the morning for a quick chat, then head outside to play softball to relax their nerves before going to the studio to record for the day. 
One of the songs that was recorded during the Versus sessions but not released on the album would be Better Man. O'Brien took an immediate liking to the song after hearing the band rehearse it, and after telling the band he thought it would be a huge hit, Vedder seemed reluctant to use it for the record. O'Brien would claim in the book Everybody Loves Our Town that Vedder wanted to give the song away as part of a Greenpeace benefit album and purposely sabotaged the recording so it couldn't be used on Versus. The album cover shot by Jeff Ament in Montana would show a sheep trying to break loose through a fence. According to Ament, the cover was a metaphor for how the band felt at the time, stating, We were slaves. Not helping was the media attention, with Vetter telling Rolling Stone the title dealt with the media scrutiny the band was under, stating, They were writing all these articles, our band against somebody else's band, what the hell are they talking about? You know, don't try to separate the powers that be, we're all in this together. The album originally was going to be titled Five Against One, before it was renamed Versus. Ament would tell Rolling Stone, For me, that title represented a lot of struggles that you go through trying to make a record. Your own independence, your own soul, versus everybody else's. In this band, and I think in rock in general, the art of compromise is almost as important as the art of individual expression. You might have five great artists in the band, but if they can't compromise and work together, you don't have a great band. It might mean something completely different to Eddie, but when I heard that lyric, it made a lot of sense to me. Despite the album's name change, there are a few versions of cassette tapes with the original title on them. Released on October 19, 1993, Versus wouldn't be accompanied by any music videos for MTV as the band didn't want to be overexposed. That did little to hurt the band's sales as the album set a sound scan record upon its release, moving a whopping 950,000 copies in its first week of release. For comparison, Nirvana's third album In Utero, which came out a month prior, moved only 180,000 copies in its first week. Epic Records, Pearl Jam's label would put out six singles, none of which featured videos. Their label would push for a video to be released for Go, but the band declined. Other singles off the album included Daughter, Animal, Elderly Woman Behind the Counter in a Small Town, Dissident, and Glorified G, all of which charted. It was around the release of Verses that Eddie Vedder would grace the cover of Time Magazine with a headline that read, All the Rage. But Vedder didn't volunteer or ask to be put on the cover. He would remark in Everybody Loves Our Town, I never knew that somebody could put your face on the cover of a magazine without asking you, that they could sell magazines and make money and you don't have the copyright on your face or something. He would tell the LA Times in a separate interview, I'm worried about the hype thing, that if people start seeing your picture everywhere and hear all about this spokesman stuff, they'll get turned off. I didn't see being on the cover of Time as an accomplishment for the band, I was afraid it might be the nail in the coffin. It was during an interview with local station KISW that Vetter reportedly told the interviewer that he wanted to wipe his butt with the Time magazine cover, but Courtney Love would claim that Vetter was being manipulative. In the same book, she would allege that Time magazine originally wanted to put Kurt Cobain on the cover, but he declined to be interviewed by the publication, so instead they went with Vetter who offered to talk. At the end of the day, he never ended up talking to the magazine, but they would put his picture on the cover anyways. Love would claim that Kurt was upset over the move. And Pete Townsend of The Who would recall to Rolling Stone Vetter's feelings in 1993, recalling, The first meeting I had with Vetter, he said, Help me, I don't know whether I want this. I think I said, Once you've been elected, you have to serve as mayor. It was nearly a month after the album came out that Vetter would find himself in prison. Pearl Jam's manager's assistant, Colleen Combs, would talk to author Mark Yarm about Eddie Vedder's struggles with fame in 1993 following the release of the band's album Versus. She would say, Pearl Jam was getting bigger and bigger. 10 was a hit quickly, and then Verse set the all-time highest first week sales record. It looked like things were never going to calm down. Eddie Vedder didn't go through the building process the years it takes to get climatized to what's happening. It was all at once for him. Otherwise, he would have known he just couldn't go bar hopping with somebody on tour. Now, Pearl Jam was two weeks into their US tour in November of 1993 to promote the record Versus, which came out one month earlier. The band had stopped in New Orleans for three shows, and the night following the first show, Vetter found himself in the French Quarter at four in the morning, and he was joined by members of the supporting band named Urge Overkill, as well as Major League Baseball pitcher Jack McDowell of the Chicago White Sox. Now, Eddie and his friends were drinking at a bar in the city's French Quarter when they were approached by a local resident named James Gorman who was a local waiter and an apparent music aficionado. According to Vetter, who told author Mark Yarm, I talked to this guy for a while and we tried to walk on, but this guy just wouldn't let it go. He still had to have more. He still had to cover some major points, and Blackie from supporting band Urge Overkill says, Look man, just mellow out. We're going, you know. And this guy's going, no, 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 I just want to say one more thing. And finally, I just kind of held him up against the wall and spit in his face. Big effing deal. Anyways, all hell broke loose. Now following Eddie's spitting in Gorman's face, a fistfight erupted and spilled into the street. 
who was alleged that Vetter knocked Gorman unconscious while McDowell was injured by bouncers from a nearby nightclub. Now, when the police showed up, Eddie was charged with public drunkenness and disturbing the peace. Now, Gorman, for his part, believed that he did nothing wrong and claimed that Vetter spit on him for no reason. And one of Eddie's friends who was there claimed that Eddie Rosser, who was a member of the opening band Urge Overkill, disputed Gorman's account and claimed he went up to Vetter and said, you're not so effing great, before Vetter spat on him. And Roser would claim that once the police showed up, they told Eddie to shut up, otherwise they would arrest him. And of course he didn't comply, so the police hauled him off to jail. Now Eric Johnson, who was Pearl Jam's tour manager at the time, would be tasked with bailing out the singer, and remembered that moment telling author Mark Yarm, I got to bail Eddie out of jail at 5 in the morning, and by the time I got there, he'd already made friends with everybody. I remember the smell of alcohol when I got there, it almost burned my eyes. It was Eddie, he had been having a serious party. In 1994, a judge would acquit Eddie Vedder of a battery charge, and one of the witnesses who testified against the singer was the guy he spit on, James Gorman. But the New Orleans judge would rule, I didn't think they were believable referring to the witnesses. And Gorman, for his part, would file a $3 million lawsuit against Vedder, but of course it went nowhere. So that concludes today's video, guys. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like button and subscribe. And as always, if you have suggestions for future topics, let me know in the comment section below. If you guys want to support my channel, simply watch another video, 